get into this part of our lesson together. I want you to uh, focus on the Word of God this morning. Let's get our Bibles open. Let's consider these things together. It's so important for us to, to understand the, the concepts of God's Word, what He has put forward for us in our lives. And, and this, I hope, is a very practical lesson for each and every one of us because I believe that we all, at some point in our life, want to change. And the changing in our life is something that's capable, that we're capable of. But I want us to talk about that a little bit together. First of all, many are looking to God for a magical experience. I don't know what it is. We've had a cultural shift. I could point it to certain fictional storylines that have you know, come up since 1997 or so, but uh, I'm not going to narrow them down to one particular story, but there's been a shift in our culture wherein the fiction of magic has become a present in our own welcomed reality, that we want things to be magical. And the reality of that is, and when we come to God looking for something magical to happen to us, well, unfortunately, uh, that's not going to happen. We want God to change us. And what's interesting to me is even some hymns, some hymns, if you listen to the words, basically said, here I am, Lord, change me. Well, if you stand there staring at the sky, waiting on it, you're going to stand there staring at the sky. Uh, unfortunately, we need to understand this so that we don't just stand around waiting and wondering why the Lord didn't zap me when it seems that he zapped that person over there. They're doing great. I think it's because our imaginations are fueled by the entertainment world that we're looking to God for magic. I think it's because so many false religions base their whole concept of their reality on the emotional experiences of their participants. And that's what they do. They parade somebody up to the microphone and this happened to me and this happened to me and, and everybody goes, oh, that's not truth. The reality is, seeking and serving God is not about magic. It, it, there will be no better felt than told whelming. There's not going to be this moment of faith where you just... And then everything is just wonderful from that point forward. It's just not going to happen. And now, here's the thing. I'm not trying to downplay the joy of obeying. I'm not trying to downplay the relief of knowing you're forgiven by God. I'm not trying to take away from that at all. But I think that there are some people that believe that when they come up out of the water of baptism, that their life is just set in order and that they are absolutely protected like, like sin is nothing to them. I mean, it just has no effect on them whatsoever. And that is an issue. When individuals are looking for some supernatural enabling in their obedience, they're seeking something that's unsupported by the Word of God. And, and really, because this doesn't happen, too many people go back to sin as soon as their emotions start to trail off. Oh, I was so excited and so zealous, and I was so zealous for like, oh, 10 days. And all of a sudden, you know, this temptation came up and, and I, nothing stopped me from doing it. Interesting. Hmm. But you know, on the other hand, millions and millions of lives since the gospel has been revealed to mankind in the first century through the voice of our Lord and Savior and His apostles and the Christians that, that formed the early church, that gospel message has gone out and lives have been changed. And lives have been completely changed. The one action that has to be included in our obedience to God that actually brings about change in our life is not anything other than repentance. That church word that we use a lot, that we need to understand more because you must change your life in order to be acceptable to God. And if you are looking for God to zap you with change, you are looking in the wrong direction because the change is on us. We must repent. So let's focus on the scriptural truth 
of this incredible life-changing action. Let's really look at this because we could all benefit from it. What repentance really is. Repentance is a continuous dedication. A continuous dedication. Somebody comes along and says, oh, I repented once. <laughs> that's, that's not repentance. You might have made a decision not to do something for a while. That's not repentance. Repentance is, I am done with this. That's what repentance is. Repentance is continuous dedication to the work that it requires. Now, that's kind of a roundabout definition because I don't know exactly what the work is going to be required for your life. I don't know exactly what it is that you, you are going to have to repent of. So I can't come along and say repentance is the end of, and I fill in a blank, with something. That's not how this works. Whatever, the, whatever it is that you have to repent of, it's a continuous dedication to having stopped that, to having pushed that away. And, and consider how it's involved and it, it's enabled by every part of gospel obedience. Now, I, here's, one of the, here's one of the problems that we run into. When I come along and say the most important thing is repentance, I've said something wrong. You understand that? And I'm not trying to teach you this morning that the most important thing is repentance. Everything in the gospel plan of salvation is essential for you to be saved, and then we have to maintain that. But look at how repentance is part and parcel of every aspect of what we have found from the New Testament Scripture and usually describe as the plan of salvation. Repentance is a necessary process initiated by hearing that Jesus gave His life for me. When I understand that what was required for us to be brought back to reconcile ourselves with God was something to pay the price for our transgressions, our own choices, my own choices that separated me from God. And I understand that I couldn't do it myself. You couldn't do it yourself. We can't do it together. Even if we added up all of the souls that are gathered even today in this whole room, we don't have enough worth in order to meet that price. But then Jesus gave his life for me. Why did Jesus have to die for me? Because I sinned. That's it. I'm done with sin. Do you understand? That's the conclusion that needs to be drawn. Repentance is part that, that it's a necessary process. It begins when we find out what it cost our Lord and Savior. Repentance is a perpetual action motivated by the moment we believe. When we embrace the understanding that sin is wrong and God's will is right and that, that hell is waiting for sinners and that heaven is waiting for those that seek God's forgiveness, then we work on a perpetual action of repentance. Repentance is a determination of a better direction. I am determined to walk the straight and narrow way. Mark, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus gave us the directions to heaven. We're very familiar with those passages, aren't we? You know, Jesus turned to this audience. He said, enter by the narrow gate. Go the narrow way. It's the way that leads to life. He said it was difficult, but he said, do that and choose that. Now, did he say, just stand there and I will zap you onto the narrow way? I just stand there for a moment. I'll transport you over here to the narrow way. No, he said, you get up and walk through the narrow gate. You walk down the narrow road. That's what we're striving to do, and that's what we need to do. It's a determination of a better direction when we confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. It's not just Jesus Christ that, well, I like His advice from time to time. Or He's a pretty good teacher. No, He is the Son of God who gave His life for me, and all that He says is absolute truth. That's what we embrace and we walk His way. Repentance is a greater purpose in life. There's lots of purposes to live for. I know people who live for their next meal. I am occasionally one of those people. You know? I live for it. Live for this adventure. Live for this moment. How many times have we said that? We have to have a greater purpose to live for. What is our greater purpose that we're living for as children of God, the greater purpose we live for is to avoid sin, be approved of God, and find our welcome home one day. All of that greater purpose has to have a beginning place because we've dug ourselves a hole. We've got ourselves into a pit. 
where we can't get out and we need to come up to at least level ground. And that's the opportunity. First Corinthians chapter six, verses uh, nine through 11, essentially in verse number 11 is the focus I want you to look at. But it says you have been washed and sanctified and justified. Justified means brought up to the line. We are brought up to the line. We're given a fresh, a fresh place to start to pursue our greater purpose of life, making it home to heaven. Repentance is a willingness to maintain the newness of life. You ever have something new? You ever have something new? I knew a fellow, he was a plumber in Union City, Tennessee. He had a brand new truck. And, and any time he bought a brand new truck and brought it into the fleet, you know what the first thing he did? He went to the toolbox on the side of the truck and he opened it up and he went, bam, right on the side of the truck. And they put the hammer back and said, let's get to work. You know what he was trying to avoid? That whole, don't scratch the new truck. Don't, don't touch the new truck. Don't, you know, that whole thing. I don't want you to be like that guy. I don't want you to come along and say, I'm brand new. Let's run out and dent us. <laughs> No, let's not do that. Let's maintain that. Have that, that bubble. You know, have that bubble. I can remember one time, uh, Jen and I have always enjoyed Jeeps. We just always have. Now, we don't have one right now, but we've always enjoyed them, and they're completely impractical. If anyone's ever owned one, you understand that entirely. Okay? They're completely impractical. But you like them or you don't. And we had a 2012 Jeep Wrangler Sahara Unlimited awesome payment. Anyway, uh, awesome Jeep. So anyway, Hayden is like, I'm trying to think about this. Hayden is, and I'm no, no, I'm not picking on Hayden. It just happened to be he was there in the yard. Haley was involved too, so just anyway. So the Jeep was in perfect condition because it had like six miles on it. And there it was in the driveway. And suddenly someone who I've already named, had to throw a brick at his sister. And when he did this, it slipped out of his hand and hit the door of the Jeep. At that point in my existence with the Jeep, there was still supposed to be this big bubble around it to protect it from that. I didn't want the first scratch. I didn't want the first dent, the first ding. I, I had this protective layer all the way around it and guarding it, and that's kind of how I was. You know, and that's the thing. That's what we need to do with our newness of life. We need to have that bubble around us. We need to have that protection layer. I don't want the first dent. I don't want the first scratch. I'm going to you know, be very, very careful. That's what repentance is. Repentance is guarding the newness of life. So in everything that we do, everything we're expected to do to obey the gospel involves repentance. We need to work at it. Repentance is saying no to the desire of sin. You know the biggest problem with that? It's saying no to yourself. That's the thing. Have you ever had one of those absolute battles of willpower? You know, one of the classic things that we Americans do is go on a diet. It's a classic thing that we do. It's become a, just become a hallmark of our culture. And there we will stand looking in the fridge going, don't do it, don't do it. You know, Let's see. you got to say no to yourself. That's the problem with repentance is you got to say no to yourself. And unfortunately, it's a lot easier to say no to yourself when everybody else is watching. It's the moments when no one is watching that's really difficult. But we need to say no to ourselves, saying no to things that we may have freely done before in our lives. You know, one of those things that, you know, when we're raised in the environment of the Lord's church, perhaps we haven't wandered out into the world a whole lot. And there's not a whole lot of difference between our life as children and our life as a Christian, as far as worldliness goes, hopefully. But the thing is, there are some folks that come out straight out of the world into Christ. And there may have been things that they have done before that they never even thought twice about. Those, some of those things have to go. We need to understand we've got to say no to the things of the world. The desires of the flesh are the enemy of the soul, especially when we allow the flesh to be our focus. Galatians chapter 5. Take a look over there with me if you would. <clears throat> we haven't done a whole lot of page turning to this point. 
But Galatians chapter 5, verse number 19, it says this. <clears throat> now, what's interesting to me is Paul, through inspiration, God, through Paul's inspired pen, declares that everybody knows that these things are wrong. Because that's what it says right here with the word evident. Unfortunately, we have had such a shift in our society that it's kind of a revelation that when we read this, that's actually wrong? Uh, yeah, take a look. Look what it says. Verse number 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident or, or known, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and anything like those things. That's what it means by and the like. Isn't that interesting? I'm sure that that sounds like Friday night to some people. That whole list. These things are wrong. These things are sin. These things are the enemy of the soul. They will destroy our eternal hope. Look what it says next. It says in verse number 21, as it continues after that list, it says, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There are things that we can participate in that will jeopardize our eternal hope of heaven. And we need to understand that those are not terribly unusual things do you get that it's not like those things only happen somewhere else on the other side of the planet those things are happening down the street right here in good old Perigu. that's what we need to understand and so when we realize that there's a situation where the apostle paul tells us that there are things that, that the flesh wants that the soul will be destroyed by, we better be careful not to get into those things. Those actions are the base pleasure, the, the, are the roots of temptation, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Those are the big categories. Those words, those sins described there, written there, those things are fit within those three big categories. There's almost an endless list of corrupt things that people pursue for the pleasure or for escape. And, and that's one of the worst parts about this. You know what's interesting to me? It's, it's ironic and it's bitter irony. Most of what the world pursues that corrupts them is to escape their reality in the world. So they don't like the way their life's going, so they pursue more of it. Isn't that kind of like hitting yourself on one finger with a hammer so you set out another finger to get hit again and another finger? Isn't that what it is? There has to come a point where a lesson like this makes sense where you go, I don't want more worldliness to escape from the worldliness I don't like. Let's get rid of worldliness altogether. Repentance is not slowing down with something. And I want us to be very clear on this. I can't tell you how many times earlier I brought up diets. I know they're sensitive. I know they're sensitive. And I've been on 400 of them in my lifetime. But anyway, here's a, someone will come back and they'll come along and they'll say, you know, I really want to do this. So what I'm doing is I'm cutting back. I'm just cutting back. You know, uh, I only eat six candy bars a day instead of 12. I'm cutting back. Uh, I'm, I'm slowing down. It's what we try to do. You know, we come along, we have a sin. So let's think about this for a second. We're guilty of fornication, so we're just slowing down. What? We're guilty of uh, adultery, so we're just cutting back a little bit. You know? Is, is, that what, is that what repentance is? Is repentance, you know, where we come along and say we pace ourselves toward it? You know, sin's okay as long as we keep getting it smaller. No? That's not how this works. Repentance is not slowing down. Repentance is not cutting back. Repentance is abruptly stopping. There's a phrase, and it, 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 I couldn't find a conclusive source to its beginning, and every one of us have heard this phrase. Cold turkey. Okay? That means stop now. 
You stop. That's it. Done. And, and I'm going to tell you something, and I realize this. I realize for me to stand up here and say, stop right now, it's way easier than stopping right now. I get that, okay? I understand. I'm still human. But here's the thing. We have to stop with absolute determination. And yes, we may falter, but don't plan on it. Stick with it. Stay with repentance. Stay with, I don't do this anymore. And make that abrupt stop. So that when you do mess up, you don't go, well, it's just part of the process of cutting back. No, stop the sin. Why? Why should I stop sin? Revelation 21, 27. If it's not highlighted or underlined or a little star beside it or something to get your attention when you go by, you know what it is. As soon as I tell you what it's going to say, there shall by no means enter it, which is heaven. There shall by no means enter heaven anything that defiles, causes an abomination or a lie. What will not be allowed in heaven? Sin. If sin is against you, you will not be allowed into heaven. Isn't that something? So I don't want to just trail off and have just a little bit left when the Lord shows up. Abruptly stop. That's what repentance really is. Repentance is denying our flesh and it's walking a new and better way. One of the things that we, we do this ridiculous notion, well, I, if I listen to God, I just can't have any fun. Well, you really need to redefine fun. You really do. If that's, if that's a conclusion that you've come to, that is worldliness, that is corrupted mindset, that is not right at all. Every time God takes something away by prohibition, God says, you don't do this, He always replaces it with something far better. Look what it says. Still got your Bible open to Galatians 5? Take a look with me if you would. Galatians chapter 5, get past verse number 21 where we were, and look at verse number 22. But... But is a wonderful change of direction. You know, that's the thing. We had these worldly things, these works of the flesh. But over on this hand, on this side, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. You know what's interesting to me? Against such there is no law wasn't necessarily talking about the law of Moses prohibiting things. wasn't necessarily talking about the law of Christ prohibiting these, you know, these sinful things out here. Both of those did it in their time and place. Of course, the law of Christ is still standing today. But I'm, I'm telling you, I believe that that statement, against such there is no law, nobody says those things are wrong. We, we can't have joy. Well, that's against the law. Nobody says that. There is no one that stands up and says, I would hate to have a life that starts with love, joy, and peace. That would be awful. Okay, that's what it's at. The Lord took away the works of the flesh, things that we have to stop and say no to ourselves about, but He replaced it with something way better. Let's talk about God's role in our repentance. Because again, Folks are looking for God to zap them, change them, enable them, some sort of supernatural ability. Since I gave my life to God, He's going to give me this power. Here's the thing. As much as God desires our repentance, and He does, He desires my repentance, He desires your repentance, every one of us. God wants mankind to repent of their sinful ways. And as much as He wants that, and I believe He wants that as much as He wants anything, He still leaves it up to our decision. It's still our determination to see it accomplished. If God intervenes in the process of our own choices... When we make a choice, if God says, you know, here's the thing. <clears throat> I keep going to these sides with the kids and family and everything else, but here, forgive me for that. When my kids were first toddling around, remember a couple weeks ago I told you we covered everything with styrofoam and uh, foam insulation to protect Haley and all that stuff? And I said Haley, I was first kid syndrome. But anyway, here's the thing. My kids didn't have free will when they were born. That's not a religious statement. They weren't allowed to make their own decisions and then fall. You know, my kids were not allowed to play at the top of the stairs. How about that? You know, uh, I would go over there and stop them. If they started to fall down, if I could catch them, I'd sure stop them. 
Uh, they didn't get to see the results of their own choices then. Is that the way God works? Does God always reach down and stop us when we make the wrong choice? You know, hinder us from doing it? That's not how this works. So if God intervenes in the process of our choices, He's contradicting our free will. So He's not going to do that. So what choices am I talking about this morning? Whether to sin or not. God is not going to intervene in that any more than He already has in what we're about to talk about. If God selectively empowers, if God selectively empowers certain individuals against sin and not others, what does that make God? Something that the Scriptures specifically say God is not. If you have the notes in front of you, you have those uh, the handout sheets. It's Acts 10.34, like on the overhead. I noticed that it didn't make it into the handout sheets. Acts 10.34 is the specific verse on there. But Acts 10.34, Romans 2.11, Ephesians 6.9, Colossians 3.25, tell us God is not a respecter of persons. God does not enable person A and refuse person B so that person A will never sin and person B will never do what's right. God does not do that. And so here's the thing, even among those that are supposed to be Christians, I've known some people that really, really struggle constantly and other people that it's pretty easy for them to do what's right. So did God give the person over there a better opportunity? It's not how this works. It's not what God has done. There is no doubt that God provides us with plenty of motivation to repent. God's instructions direct us to repent. Acts chapter 2, verse number 38 to 42, they were instructed, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You want to know what to do to be saved. It's going to involve the word repentance. Acts chapter 17, verse number 30, we're told that God says, Now commands all men everywhere to repent. Every one of us are part of all men everywhere. God expects that of you. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 9. All souls are admonished to use this moment of God's patience, and that's what we have time for. The moment of God's patience is this moment of time to come to repentance. Come to it. Obey repentance. It's what we need to do. But you know, he also has warnings. Because sometimes somebody comes along and says, did you follow the instructions? Well, I kind of made it up the way that I wanted to do it all the way along, and it sort of turned out. We need to be more akin to the instructions, and sometimes because the instructions are not that compelling to us, we need warnings. We need warnings. One of the instructions that I see continuously broken is do not step on this. You ever see that at the top of a stepladder? Do not use this as a step. <laughs> you, know, you ever you know, wonder why they put that on there? Andrew, it's interesting because warnings need to be clear. Warnings. Think about this. Matthew chapter 25, verse number 46 is an insight to the day of judgment wherein the unrighteous will go away into everlasting punishment. Now, Brother Andrew this morning in his Bible study class talked about that, talked about the fires of that place of punishment. And I want us to understand this passage and all the rest of them that talk about condemnation, punishment for sinners, are not just put there so preachers have something to scare people about. This is a real place where souls will actually end up if they do not prepare themselves, if they do not repent. Luke chapter 13, verse number 3 and verse number 5. These people came to the Lord. They came to the Lord and said, can you believe what He's doing to those people over there? Can you believe what He's doing? Killing folks for their faith, right? And the Lord looked at them and said, unless you repent, you're all going to perish likewise. You will likewise perish. Repentance is absolutely essential to us. And, and being killed in this life is nothing compared to ending up separated from God for eternity. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 to 14. 
We need to take on holiness. Well, that's part of repentance is stop sin and replace it with good stuff. Take on holiness. What does it say there in that place? Without which no one will see the Lord. Unless you stop sinning and do what's right, you will never be with the Lord. We need to understand that. God's role in our repentance is to educate us. Teach us and direct us to go and do what's right and to warn us of what will happen if we don't. God instructs and encourages our choice to abandon sin and to do what's right. And in fact, if we choose to listen to God, what we're going to do, we're going to take on this really ancient word. It's a strange word. Nobody uses this word. We use part of it. We talk about horror. Horror. That's part of this word, but abhor. To, to find loathsome. To, to reject entirely. To hate sin. If we listen to God and we follow His directions and we choose to do that each and every day of our life, we are going to hate the idea of ever continuing in sin. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Romans chapter 12, verse number 10. Because of the knowledge of what sin does to our souls, we should reject it and we must reject it. Until we understand, until we get to that point of realization, I am a soul housed in this fleshly body, that my soul will never die, that I will be somewhere forever, and I want to be in the right somewhere forever, I better do some things to make sure my soul is intact and sin is what ruins it for my soul. That knowledge is what causes me to reject sin. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is separation from God. I don't want that. Because of that, I want repentance. By understanding where sin takes us. Look with me in Revelation 20. Revelation doesn't have to be a scary book. It's not, it's not the point. But I'll tell you what. This passage, it needs to raise the hair up on the back of your neck. This passage needs to to show us that there's going to come a time where our loving and compassionate Father who is full of patience and mercy and, and love and grace and all of those wonderful things, this, world, this world's experiment is going to come to an end. And we're going to face God. And look what it says over here. We're in Revelation chapter 20 and beginning at verse number 12. It says, Then I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were open, which, uh, and another book was open, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. When I understand what sin does to my eternal hope, to my soul, I reject it. Reject it. I don't have time for it. I don't, I don't, don't keep it around. You know, think about that for a second. You keep some deadly poison just on the counter in the kitchen. How about that? You're going to keep some deadly poison in a water bottle in a kitchen? You know, you know what it is and you try to stay away from it. But is everybody else? It's not what we do. When we find out something that's that deadly, we stay away from it entirely. Let's talk about our life being changed and get to this, uh, the end of this lesson. The last point's here. Our life will be changed when we change it. God's part is instruction. God's part is motivation. Our part is making and maintaining the changes. We got to get to work. If we're waiting for God to transform us, I know I've said this already, but I want to be so clear on this because this is an overwhelming misunderstanding going on out here. If we're waiting for God to transform us, we have misunderstood the Scriptures. And a lot of people do that, 2 Peter 3.16. We are not changed by God. We, are cha we change ourselves because of God. 
because of God, because of who God is. My creator, my sustainer, Genesis chapter 1, Acts 17, 24 to 27, God who made the world and everything in it. God made mankind, one blood of all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth in his pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. And why did you make us, God? Why did you make mankind? So that they might seek for the Lord, grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. God is my creator. Because of God, I will reject the things that reject him. I will look to the things that glorify him because of what God has done for me. I know it says us up there. I don't always have to read the words that I wrote. It's me. What God has done for me is why I refuse to continue in sin, why I've changed my life. Romans chapter six verses or chapter five verses six through eleven tells us that God sent his son to save me. He gave his life to save me so that I have the hope of heaven. Sin is what cost that. I rejected and I changed my life because of what God has done. First Timothy chapter four, verse number 10. Because he has taken the time to teach me. I can't remember the first time that Psalm 119, verse number 102 hit me. It just, it just, it just, I was... I just couldn't even, I, it just, it blew my mind when it says that I've kept my feet from every evil way for you yourself have taught me. Did you know that there's some incredibly capable people in this world that don't have the time to teach me how to be incredibly capable? They wouldn't bother with it. It's just one of those things where we have these people and they're over here doing and they're doing an amazing thing and, they, and they're just the best at it and they don't have the time to run over here and teach me how to be the best at it. But did you know the Almighty, the Almighty Father in heaven has looked down upon me with loving favor? How many times have we prayed for that? God, guard, and direct us. Look down upon us with loving favor. He has done that and He has taught me. God gave me instructions. I am going to follow them. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15. Study to show yourself approved of God. A worker need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the instructions of God. That's what it says. We need to look to that. Because God has extended the opportunity of heaven to me. So that when Jesus in John chapter 14 turns to his audience, he's not just talking to them there. He's talking to me today. You believe in me? Or believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. And that's me. I want to see that place. And because that God has done that, changed my life. I'm going to change because of God. I'm not waiting for God to zap me. I want to do the things of God. A new and better life is waiting for us. What does this life look like? You know, because sometimes we have this, this, uh, this concept. Well, in the Bible, it's just an ideal situation. Where, and I don't think anybody can achieve that. And, and I don't think it's just realistic. And I, and I, don't, I can't ever have a life like that. I, that's not true. Not at all. You can absolutely have the life that God has provided because God's the one to design it. What does this life look like? Well, earlier we looked at uh, Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to do that because there is a life described in Galatians chapter 5 that is Lord-centered, self-denied, faith-following, and enlightened by the truth of God. That's what that life looks like. And so when we consider that passage of Scripture, I want you to consider it this way. This can be your life if you repent of your sins and obey the gospel and maintain that repentance. You wake up each and every morning with a life of love. You love others and they love you. Your life is joyful. Yes, bad days happen. We're still in this world. But you have a deep set happiness because of the true and enduring hope for this life and beyond that you possess. In your life, you know peace. The same peace that allowed you to sleep last night, no matter what's going on in the world today. You in your life are able to act patiently in all circumstances, because your perspective on life is certain and sure and better than those who do not respect God. Every day you reflect warmth and you extend true kindness to those around you. 
You are truly a good person in word and deed, determined to seek goodness, offer goodness, and live by God's standard of goodness. You know that your faith comes by hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17. And it is that word for which you hunger and thirst. Matthew 5, 6. You are faithfully committed to be faithful to God, to your family, to your responsibilities. You walk in a careful and self-controlled fashion. To ensure that you are not making any missteps. That's the life that God designed. That's what God intends for us. He didn't just say the fruit of the Spirit is really nice if you have one of those trees. He said walk by the Spirit. Do those things and have those things. Repentance must be an active part of our lives. If we desire the best possible life here, and we should, a life that is filled with the true hope of salvation, Know that you can change your life. Know that you can do it. You can remove sin from your life. You can endure hardships with faith intact. You can say what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We can say those things when we repent and push away the sins of the past and focus on the goodness of the moment of today. We can change our lives because of God, because of His offer of forgiveness and His offer of heaven. If you are not yet a Christian, God wants you to be saved. But God is not going to zap you with salvation. God is not going to save you against your decision. But He has blessed you with this moment in your life to make a decision. Gospel obedience includes life changing repentance and it's waiting for you. Even as Christians, we have to maintain. We have to maintain a life through careful steps and repentance when we falter. There's an opportunity to begin the best possible life right now. You know, I realize that when I read through those nine fruits of the Spirit and adapted them to a life, that not all of us, even as Christians, have really found all of that. But you can. Because it's God's plan. There's an opportunity to begin the best possible life right now. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, gives you this opportunity. You see, stopping doing what's wrong and doing what's right from now on is a good thing. It's beneficial, but it doesn't take care of the past sins. It doesn't take care of what we've done before. It just changes what we're doing now. So I need something else. I need something more. So I need to understand that Jesus Christ paid the price for my soul, my sins, so that I can have an opportunity of forgiveness. And when I submit to God's plan, give my life to Him, that standing up and saying that I believe He's the Son of God, and submitting to the water of baptism so I can have my sins washed away, that all of those things actually work and give me a fresh start. A fresh start to begin the best possible life. A life that is filled with the hope of an everlasting tomorrow. This morning, if you're not a Christian, why not? Why not? What's out there in the world that's so much better than what God offers? I can't see it. I don't understand it. But I'd sure like to talk to you about it and sit down with an open Bible and let's get to the points of finding a faith and obedience. If you're not a Christian, become one. If you are a child of God not living the way you should, fix it. Fix it. Repent. Pray to God for forgiveness. Get yourself back where you belong. If you need our help, we offer it to you. If we can help you come to the Lord or back to the Lord, let us help you as we stand and sing.